Hello, I'm Eric Snodgrass, and thank you for watching this in-depth ag forecast brought to you by Nutrient Solutions. Just to let you know, after we cover uh, the near-term forecast here, which is going to be quite volatile, we will finish this forecast with the latest updates from the Long Range European, talk about some important trends there for this upcoming winter. So let's start off first with some imagery here that's going to show us uh, what's been going on with the satellite today. And as we just take a look at the weather systems across the United States, of course, this has been the cutoff low that once sat over parts of the Tennessee Valley, migrated over to parts of the Mid-South, and has been slowly lifting north today across parts of Illinois. In fact, you can see the center of that circulation sitting right about over the top of Macomb de Peoria, that area here in Illinois. Meanwhile, to the south and east of it, a lot of scattered storms here and putting out some heavy rain. And this cutoff low has chased a lot of people out of the fields for harvest progress in this whole area here over much of this past week. We do have a tropical disturbance that's just off the shore here. And there's this one's been given about a 20% chance of development. And while it's not going to be a main factor for becoming a tropical system, it will be supplying some of the moisture that North Carolina is going to be seeing here uh, in the next uh, few days here. And it's going to put out some pretty heavy rainfall. But my attention really goes back to what we saw throughout the day kind of coming out of the southwest. And I'm talking here about the high level clouds you see here, really just kind of screaming from that southwest to northeast trajectory. So that tells us there's a pretty deep trough off the coast. And we've got some really interesting things kind of coming together in this forecast. So let's just go take a look at it. Here's the cutoff low, finally getting absorbed back into the flow. But what I want to be paying close attention to here is this trough here. This trough here may not look like much, and then the real large one that you see back here with the Aleutian Islands. So what's going to happen is as this trough begins to progress through the Pacific Northwest, it's going to take the trough to the south, which I'm going to put an X in, and toss it very quickly by Saturday into the northern plains. And then this trough that's kind of back here, it's still just to the kind of north and west of the Puget Sound, it's going to dive down here to the southern plains and emerge on Sunday into Monday into the southern plains and give us a severe weather threat. But then this is the largest of the three troughs that we're going to watch eventually next week come into the Pacific Northwest, emerge in the central plains between the two, and produce a large and very slow moving system. Now, when I say um, slowest of the moving, that's because these features here are really tight short waves. And this is a much longer wave, and it's going to evolve such that it stays quite long as it moves over the Intermountain West. We're talking snow in parts of Wyoming and other parts of the Rockies, too, and I'll show you that in a few moments. Now, this cutoff low, as I said, has been a problem for a lot of us here in the eastern part of the United States. And just looking back over the last three days, that's all that's shown here. You can see that parts of Tennessee, getting down into Alabama, Georgia, over toward the Appalachian Mountains, we have added a lot of rain from this cutoff low. And then some places here in Indiana and Illinois, Kentucky, even this part of Missouri, I've seen some very heavy rainfall as well. We've been much drier uh, in parts of uh, the central United States here. And there's been several places in here, like I'm thinking right around Kansas City, for example, that have really been over forecast in terms of precipitation. That's just not gotten back around to that area. But you can already see what's coming through Arizona. And there's more of this on the way as that first of those three waves starts to make its way through the Intermountain West. Now, our all hazards weather map right now doesn't look like much is going on, right? We have the flood issues here, which we've been talking about. We have a special weather statement in this area. This is actually about fire risk today, but it's the blues that I'm starting to think about because while these here are for frost risk, this one is for winter weather advisory. And that's just going to be the beginning of what's going to be a very active time period here coming up. Okay, let's first just get a quick glance at the near term by using the 18Z NAM. And as we play this forward, you're just going to see a lot of scattered precipitation ahead of that uh, cutoff low moving through Illinois, Iowa, Wisconsin, Minnesota, I mean, this whole area back toward Michigan and the eastern Corn Belt. And that's just going to sit there through the overnight hours and try to move north. We also have scattered precip coming through North Dakota, an area that has been drier as of late, but this isn't the main show. The main show is coming up behind that. So as we play this forward, okay, Appalachian Mountains down to Georgia, more scattered precip. This is Friday through Friday evening. Same thing here in this section around the Great Lakes. But look at what's coming through parts of the Great Basin, through the Snake River Valley, emerging into Wyoming. What's going to happen is through the overnight hours on Friday into Saturday morning, that first wave ejects and comes out over the mountains and starts to form what we call a lee cyclone, a lee side of the Rocky Mountains. And it's going to emerge up here in the Dakotas by Saturday morning. And now you can start to see the spin on it Saturday afternoon and evening. So this is going to increase our thunderstorm threat to the north here as well. And precipitation totals could easily top an inch from some of this. And then that is just system number one. Okay. 
System number two is cutting through right now here in parts of Washington. And if we just put all these together, I want to give you this broad picture first. This is the 12Z European Ensemble looking at the next 10 days, all three of those waves adding up in terms of total precipitation chances being greater than, uh, 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 I'm sorry, probability of getting an inch or more. And what we notice here is that we're going to be hitting the southern plains hard, possibly some severe storms. The first wave coming through here, the second wave south, and the third wave running right back through the northern plains, adding a lot of rain to parts of the Dakotas and Minnesota. And I, I know a lot of harvest progress has been made there, uh, but still, this is going to be adding a lot of rain on top of some drier regions uh, as of late. Same thing right in through here as well. This has been an area that's been quite dry. Now, to put that into context, let me at least go show you the latest drought monitor. This was released this morning. And we've seen drought develop over the last uh, four weeks quite a lot here in uh, parts of the Southern Plains, Oklahoma, and Texas. And we've also seen it uh, kind of stick around in this particular region. So it's important to know that where some of this heavy rain is going to be coming through, we have been quite dry as of late. Now, let's get back to the main story here now that we've got some context to this and see these waves moving through. So remember, we're watching one, two, and three. Ready? Now, before I do any of this, my most important concern longer term is the ridge that you see here. When that breaks down, we stop seeing these troughs coming into the west and the pattern will progress forward. And I made a case for when I thought that was going to happen on Monday and I've got an update for you in a few minutes. But what we see here is that going through Friday and into Saturday morning and midday, there's the wave that was here moving now into and ejecting into the plains. We talked about that. The second wave, there it is, see it? The second wave is now here on Sunday evening coming out in the southern plains. And then the big deep wave that cuts through the west and sits over the Great Basin, possibly closing off a contour here, then eventually comes out in the central plains right there by next uh, Tuesday night, Wednesday. And that one's going to be the one that because of the length of the wave and the depth of the trough and the fact that it's got a negative tilt to it, which means it's not leaning forward into the flow but back, means that they're all three going to attempt to lift pretty quickly to the north here. And that's important because each one of these waves, because of their tilt, lifting to the north, means the likelihood of breaking down that massive ridge that's downstream, therefore changing both the temperature and precipitation pattern, is limited through at least the maybe 16th, 17th, 18th. Because as I keep playing out there, look, I'm out to the 15th and 16th. Yeah, a wave tries to come through here. But a ridge is already reforming on the backside. The big ridge is still going up between you know, the Hudson Bay and Greenland. And another very deep trough is already waiting in the wings off of the coast. So going into week two, this is still the dominant factor. And there's that ridge. I say we got to break down. Okay, we've now got the idea behind the pattern. Let's go see what it does. And this is a great example of where our models are working in concert. Okay, so I got the GFS on the left and the European on the right. These are the 12Z runs. Okay, cutoff low, moves north. Okay, everything is all good here. First wave coming through the Great Basin to the Snake River Valley, Central and Northern Rockies, timed perfectly in both models. It then ejects, there it is, by Saturday evening. So GFS places the low here, European, almost exact same spot. Very, very similar here. European is wetter, like I mentioned, over in the Mid-Atlantic and the Carolinas, still going through Saturday. So that's that tropical system I mentioned to you a few moments ago. All right, so first wave moves into Ontario. This is where the GFS gets a little more progressive. You can see that the center of the low is here in the GFS. And in the European, it's there. Now you're going, wait a minute, you almost circled the exact same spot. Well, that's quite a difference right in through here. And that's part of the just known bias we have in the GFS. It's a progressive model. It moves things much more quickly. So when does the second wave emerge? Well, the GFS places it here in Kansas. The European's a little bit farther south over the Red River. And, but it, the point is, is that it's there. And so going into Monday overnight hours, excuse me, Sunday overnight hours into Monday morning, we could be watching for severe storms to move through this area, all dependent on the timing here. That then could possibly push some rain over Kansas City, which does need it. And then that wave moves, as you see here in the European, basically toward where the border of Iowa, Illinois, and Wisconsin is. Uh, the European, or excuse me, the GFS is just quicker. Okay, third system, ready? deep trough into the mountains. Look at the snow here in the GFS. It's also in the European. It then emerges on Tuesday afternoon and evening, and that's where we're going to be watching. Now, you just notice here, 
that the GFS is quicker with the emergence and it brings out those storms on Tuesday night. The European brings out the storms here, but it just is a little bit later in letting the full wave come out. So do you notice the GFS being more progressive has the low here, the European has it here. Both of this is 7 p.m. on Wednesday. So that front's already in Illinois, back down to Louisiana. And in this case, it cuts through you know, the border of Iowa, Nebraska, and back down to Texas. So you can see the differences, right? They may look the same when you just blur your eyes, but there's a couple hundred mile, not a couple hundred, more like 600 mile difference here in the position of these lows. But still, both models producing the same system little bit different placement, but same time. And it lifts to the upper Midwest and into Ontario and eventually on out. And then both models, I know I'm looking at operational runs, do attempt to calm things down a little bit after that as we head past the 15th toward the 16th and 17th. But look at what's coming into the West after this. The West is gonna continue to be active as long as those deep troughs sit there. So why don't we just add it all up and take a look. Next uh, seven days from the European, shown here. Now again, we're gonna have a difficult time using these models to pinpoint exact precipitation amounts. What I'm looking for is the overall pattern. Are they similar? Because there's the ECMWF and here's the GFS. And that's pretty good alignment, but there are differences, so we better talk about them. One of the big differences is what's happening here in this part of the high and northern plains back into Wyoming. You can see that the European, shown in the green to blue, is wetter, also down here in the southern plains. The GFS being quicker brings more moisture, I think, over here toward you know, Missouri, Illinois. Uh, and then notice how much wetter the European is bringing that tropical moisture in, like I said, to the mid-Atlantic. Now what's interesting is this, because that third wave will have enough cold air in it to be producing some snow. And let's just go have a look at it from the 12Z European. Now this is an operational run. We're just looking for placement here, not amounts. But here I am out toward Monday, getting into Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday of next week. And here in the Central Rockies, back to Utah, and this part of, um, in this part right here of Wyoming, we, we could be looking at some pretty heavy snows here at high elevation. We're gonna have to watch out for that carefully, all right? All right, from this point, let's now go take a look at how things shape up from day 10 and beyond. So what you notice is we still have the higher heights in place here, but the deeper trough still is being rebuilt right there. So ridge in the Midwest and the Central Plains, brief troughing over the Great Lakes, and as we just play this forward, you don't see this getting here. And I, I told you on Monday I thought it would do it, and I gave my, my reasons for why, but the models are refusing to break this pattern down. They're just sticking with persistence. So the good news about this pattern, not seeing these troughs come in just yet, is that we end up getting, let's shrink that back up, we end up getting a drier than normal go of it into week two. If it's wetter anywhere, it's gonna be down here in the Southern Plains, possibly extending here into this part of the Plains and Midwest. But with that deep trough off the coast, look at this rain coming for the coast. And the European, same thing, ready? Day 10, 11, 12, 13, 14th, I mean, it just says the same thing. And so you wouldn't be surprised when I show you that these are the precipitation anomalies from the European on week two. Okay, we got the near-term precip out of the way. Let's talk temperatures and then do long range. Last seven days, very, very hot in the Northern Plains and Canadian Prairie, much above average. Temperatures averaging 15 Fahrenheit above normal. What we saw today was still warm there, but let's take a look at how these temperatures are gonna evolve. While the much colder air comes into the west, the central and southern plains goes back, I mean, look at this. This is Saturday. From Kansas City all the way back to the Panhandles, mid to upper 90s in this area. Very hot out ahead of the system. But you know the wave comes out on Sunday here. We do get some cooler air behind it. So the west is gonna go over pretty substantially. I mean, this is cold air, but that's how we got that snow in place back here. But we're talking temperatures that are 10 to 20 to 25 degrees cooler than normal inside that deeper trough. And as you can imagine, that's going to continue out to the day 5 through 10 time period. But not breaking down this ridge here is what's really causing the problems. And as you know, going out here to day 10 through 15, the deeper trough still is there. The ridge is in the middle. So we tend to still see those above normal temperatures. This is going to push off the arrival of the first frost in this area even later and later into the season. And we go much more than 10 to 15 days before we get that first frost in that area. We're talking about maybe a record late first frost in the northern plains. Now, how did I get this wrong? Remember, I relied a lot on the MJO. 
and this is what it's now doing. Instead of popping out at higher amplitude in phase six and seven, seven especially being a cold signal for the central and eastern part of the United States, the MJO loses everything, collapses back into null space, which means, just as a simple translation, we've lost the strong signal of both the moisture and energy transport out of the tropics, specifically the Indian Ocean and the West Pacific, that could alter the jet stream pattern away from what it is. There's no signal here that would say break this pattern down and change it. So I bet too much on it doing that, and, and now you're, I'm going to see that the arrival of cooler air in the eastern two-thirds of North America will be later and later in the month. But we need to talk about what's beyond that because we continue to see a very robust La Nina signal here. The Southern Oscillation Index is back up to a 10, almost 11. Uh, that's plenty high. And I want you to notice something here. While the look of this La Nina here is very similar to last year, this is different. It's still cold there and it's been much colder here in the Gulf of Alaska. And what this has really got me thinking is the possibility that unlike what I had originally thought where I had told you that maybe this La Nina would be about half strength of last year, I think we've now got a more robust signal out of this moving forward. Now, what are the models doing with that? Let's first go look here at the time period of October 15 to November 15. We focused on that in the last three videos. With the redevelopment of a deeper trough in the west, we now see better precipitation from Northern California through Oregon, Washington, and Idaho. That's just persistence in the pattern. And sometimes those waves do come out in the midsection of the country, which is why you see near normal precipitation here. We're gonna be drier on either side of that. That's what we're seeing here from the model. And as you would imagine, given that the pattern is not breaking down in the models and it's persisting in the models, they just keep the warm anomalies in place as well. I'll say this, it is cooler than previously forecast, but still warmer than average. Now from there, let's go really long term. Since we got through mid-November, let's just flip on over to December, January, and February. And once again, we see a textbook forecast for La Nina. It tends to be drier in California, drier in Texas, drier along the Gulf Coast up into the mid-Atlantic. That's typical. Active Ohio River Valley storm track. We often tend to get an active storm track from Colorado lows that go through Chicago. The northwest is wetter and better precip chances for the northern plains of Canadian prairie. If this happened, my concern areas are primarily going to be Texas and California. Those would be the areas I'd be worried about for drought development over winter, should this verify. What are the differences between this and the last run? Well, the last run was a little drier. See it? That's December, January, February. From the previous run, this is the newest run. Temperature side of things. We've gotten a bit more mild in the forecast. This is the newest update here. Uh, and the previous one, let's just go look at it. See, it had more of that mild air back over the Great Basin, Four Corner States, and along the Gulf Coast. The newest run just brings a little more mild air a little bit farther north. Um, two last things I want to tell you. We all know that during the winter, there are many factors that control the week-to-week -week forecast, and all of them are subseasonal, which means this is just painting with broad brush what happens if we have a La Nina winter. That's really what you're looking at here. The second thing is this. I mentioned La Nina. This is critical information for next growing season. The latest updates from the European model, Nina region 3.4, is now to take the ensemble average ocean temperature through December and January down to almost a degree Celsius below normal. That would be what we had last year. But this is what I'm concerned about. That's a quick rebound by the time we get into next spring, back to inso neutral, possibly going into an El Nino spring and summer. And if you're a Midwestern farmer listening to this, this is important for our early spring moisture return and summer moisture return. El Ninos tend to favor less drought risk. California, this could be the signal that we would want to see in order to give us, you know, one of those miracle marches uh, or even, you know, really great February time periods where we return the moisture. So this map right here might be the more important one I'm going to show you for this entire video as we look forward into the long range. I'm talking 2022 at this point. So I'll keep an eye on it and I will keep reporting back to you, okay? Appreciate your attention today. We'll talk to you again on Monday. Thanks.